Hey, and welcome to Workflow From Home. My name is Michael, and this is a mini series dedicated to exploring the tools and techniques that help video professionals investigate and implement cloud workflows while they're working from home. Every subject that we cover in this series is really inspired by you. We read your comments, we engage in conversations, and we read articles to get a feel for what's bubbling up in the industry. And then when something clearly emerges about how people are working remotely, and then we start to understand their questions, I get inspired to write a new episode. I should point out that since all of us at Frame.io are also working from home, we've been making this whole series from our homes as well. And about a dozen of us are working together across the country to shoot and edit and create animations and titles. We're doing color correction and online and sound mixing and delivering all the episodes of this series. And a big part of what we're doing is interviewing experts in the industry to see how they've worked through the transition from on-premises to remote work as well. Of course, they're working from their homes too, which got me thinking. Over the past several weeks, one thing that has become really popular is people shooting their own interviews and their own performances. By now, we've all seen artists and musicians and actors and experts performing and appearing on calls and interviews. We have a few episodes of this series in the can now, and I've had a chance to sort of figure out not only how to optimize how I feel it needs to work and what to do when I'm recording myself, but also how to come up with ways to optimize how our interviewees look when we record them. We've learned a lot from trial and error, a few errors, and you know, when people ask, how can I make my interviews look better? We have a few answers that we'd like to share with you in this episode. So let's start with what I've been doing. I realize we all don't have the same gear, but just bear with me. First, I have a red helium camera. Thank you, Jared Land. And I'm shooting in 8K using red code 9 to 1 compression. I also have some unreleased technology that allows me to wirelessly capture a file from this camera and send it to a computer over there. And that, that proxy file is uploaded automatically to Frame.io where it's automatically sent to Vince, the editor. You don't have that technology yet, so let's just save that subject for another time. What you do have with a red helium, that is, is the ability to shoot with a simultaneous ProRes LT file, which acts as an in-camera proxy. One of the best attributes of red cameras is that I can shoot a high quality raw file, and then I can shoot a lower quality proxy all generated in the camera together. The ProRes I record is log encoded, and it matches the file name and timecode of the raw file, which I'll eventually use for an online. After I finish recording each interview, I load the magazine into my iMac Pro, I download the RAW and ProRes files to my G-Speed shuttle over Thunderbolt 3. Then I load the proxy in Resolve, I apply a LUT, and I select the Frame.io integration exporter in the Delivery tab to quickly render out a time-coded HEVC directly to Frame.io where the editor Vince is automatically notified of a new asset and can begin editing. For a 30-minute recording, the whole process of download and render and upload takes a little less than one hour, and I'm using a 20 megabit upload network. So that solves my video portion, but what if you're doing stand-ups? You might be used to using a teleprompter. I record these using an iPad teleprompter made by Caddy Buddy. When it comes to teleprompters, it's all in the mirror. Caddy Buddy is about $160 US. I like to use this one because the mirror is adjustable and it has 15 millimeter mounting rods, which makes it easy to mount to my wooden camera mounting kit. Thank you, Greg Smokler. Most importantly, the quality of the mirror is really good. It has minimal color shift, just a hint of a little bit of green, and it doesn't seem to potato chip. I find it's not prone to offensive refractions. The iPad prompter app I use is called IQ. It allows me to set the speed and trigger, start and stop with one touch, which is essential when you're shooting yourself. When it comes to audio, I cannot tell you how much I love the Smart Lav by Rode. My work friends know that I've been carrying at least one of these in my bag for years. I know it sounds a little nerdy, but if you have an easy to use lav that connects to an iPhone at your disposal at any moment, you will use it. Smart Lav is about $80 US, it plugs right into my iPhone, and it comes with an intuitive app that lets me record audio with an omnidirectional polar pattern that's really easy to mix. My favorite part is that after recording, I can select the audio file, name it to match the video file, and save it to my iPhone documents. Then I open up the Frame.io iOS app, navigate to my intended cloud directory, select upload, and then locate the file on my phone and upload it directly into Frame.io. All of the recording and uploading is done without ever leaving the phone itself. For lighting, I love using the KinoFlow LED Freestyle 31. Thank you, Frieder Hochheim. I'm not a cinematographer, and I know there's an entire religion flowing around choices for LED lights out there, but I personally prefer the Kino Freestyle for three reasons. First, the colorometry in this instrument is best in class. When it comes to shooting at home with limited resources, a top quality light will make skin tone look better. It's worth the price and I can't overstate that enough. 
The second reason is because the Kino Freestyle is among the lightest professional LED panels in its class, and it can be removed from its housing so you can hang it safely by yourself, even if you don't have dirt to steady it. Lastly, the controller is easy for anyone to use. It has a long controller extension cable, which means I can flip the red monitor around. I can sit in front of my camera, and I can hold the controller on my lap and adjust it until it looks good. Again, I am not a DP, and I know many of you watching this and shooting interviews may not be either. So this is just one way to use good tools and help capture a better image if you want. So if you think you're going to be doing a bunch of interviews, at the time that I shot this, the Caddy Buddy, the Smart Lob, and the iPad can all be ordered on Amazon and shipped to your home. When it comes to the Helium or Kino Freestyle or a C stand, I recommend signing up for an account with KitSplit or ShareGrid. If you're not familiar with these platforms, they work similarly to how Airbnb connects you to rooms to rent. So you sign up, you look for the gear you want, and the platform connects you with the owners of the equipment that are near your home. It's fixed pricing, it's ready to rent, it can include insurance, and you're likely to get help from the owners themselves in terms of a general setup and of course keeping it clean. So if you're comfortable picking up a professional camera and lighting package, this is a great way to make your interviews look and sound great. Now let's talk about the scenario of conducting an interview with another person via some kind of teleconferencing system, and you want them to be able to record their side of the interview apart from just capturing it from the raw Zoom feed. And what if your subject's unable to operate a cinema camera or doesn't have room for you know, advanced lighting or can't set up a prompter and all they have access to is a computer? Well, how do we deal with that? See, the problem with most Zoom calls is that they generally take place on laptops with built-in webcams that are placed on tables. Since table heights are roughly 30 inches off the ground or just shy of one meter, the angle of the laptop screen pitch can be between 20 and 30 degrees. The default camera on most MacBook Pros provide a field of view of 54 degrees with a sensor aperture of about 24 millimeters. This is not a flattering angle. Since these factors cannot be changed, one thing we can do is change the geometry. To do this, you need to get the computer a little further away, and you need the camera to match your eye level. If you wanna make this look a little better, use your smartphone as a key light. And perhaps most importantly, online web videos always have a video display of the other person you're talking to, which unfortunately takes your eye line off the camera and starts to mess up the nice geometry we set up. So you might need to just cover your screen up or hide the app so that when you're using it for just audio, you're able to focus on the tiny little camera at the top of the computer. In the end, these small adjustments will be subliminally noticed by the end viewer, and it can make a big difference when you've got well-shot footage next to your interviewees and you want them to look reasonably similar in quality. So now that we've applied a few of these features here, starting with my iPhone key light, which also happens to be my microphone, and we fixed our angle of attack here with a little bit better geometry, our Zoom is looking pretty good. In addition, Zoom has a cool feature in which you can record each session directly to the cloud. Then you can save that recording and share it as a video asset to Frame.io, where you can start editing your interview. Another option we have is connecting an external camera into Zoom and using that for our meetings instead of the computer camera. Even though there are lots of cameras out there that support HDMI out, a common misconception about almost every computer is that they do not have HDMI in. In other words, if you want an external camera input into your computer, you'll need an external device that converts it to either Thunderbolt, USB, or Ethernet. I'm using an AJA UTAP HDMI converter, which can take an HDMI signal out of my Sony A7R2 and connect it to my computer over USB 3.0. Then I can open my Zoom preferences, choose video, and then select my external camera. So here I am in Zoom. This is an actual Zoom recording, except we've got the A7R streaming the source, and that's going into the AJA UTAP, going into my computer over USB, and I can still use the SmartLav as my audio source. So what if you don't use the Zoom link, and you don't have access to an additional mirrorless or SLR camera? Well, we of course all have access to smartphones, so how can we make that work with a slightly more professional appeal? For smartphone recordings, I recommend downloading a third-party video recording tool that offers more manual control. There's lots of tools out there for Android and iOS, so feel free to experiment and research. I personally prefer Filmic Pro, which is about 15 bucks US. A few highlights with Filmic Pro is that I can set my resolution to 4K, my frame rate to 24, and I can connect my Rode Lav directly into the phone. I want to enable save to camera roll as well as enable timecode track. If you have an iPhone 11 Pro or an iPhone 11 Pro Max, then you also have some optical choices. 
The iPhone 11 Pro wide lens is equivalent to about the focal length of a 14 millimeter lens. The standard lens is equivalent to a focal length of about 26 millimeters. And what Apple calls the telephoto lens is equivalent to about 52 millimeters. So backing the camera up and using the 52 millimeter lens will photographically be much more appealing. Then I turn on the torch as an additional key light and I perform an auto white balance. It's helpful to put something in your chair to help you set up your shot. You can select and set the focus and you can adjust the ISO and exposure. And if you want to take this a step further, you can perform the in-app purchase of the cinematographer's kit for another 14 bucks, which gives you the ability to shoot with a log-like low contrast curve. The benefit to this is it's going to increase your control over color and contrast later, so this mild investment might be worth it to get those final tweaks to look good. So here we are on the iPhone 11 Pro, which is shooting with Filmic Pro, which is also recording my audio through the microphone, and we're using the 52 millimeter telephoto lens here. Uh, the light I have on from the camera, here is the Kino light, and we're shooting this in the low contrast mode so we have the most dynamic range in post. Once I've shot my self-interview on my iPhone, I can open up the Frame.io iOS app, I can navigate to the project I've been invited into for this interview, click on a folder, and select the Upload button. Frame.io will access your camera roll, I locate my take, and then I can upload the interview directly to Frame.io from my phone without any other work required. A notification will go to the editor and producer, and the interview is complete. We hope you're learning some useful techniques from this series. We certainly are, even as we've been making it. Recently, I did an interview with Rob Ash, the editor of The Conan O'Brien Show, and they're using Frame.io to deliver the entire show from Rob's kitchen. We interviewed Rob from his kitchen and his kids were playing in the background and the dogs walking by and sometimes the images are glitchy or the sound isn't quite right. But personally, I think this is a great opportunity for everyone to learn something new about a discipline they may not have had extensive experience with. And I noticed something interesting. With all the workflow from home challenges and all the do-it-yourself hiccups that arrive when you don't have your usual team close by, there's one discipline we can collectively expect to improve above all others while working from home troubleshooting.